Hey everyone, it's Julian, and you're never too old for bedtime stories. Tonight, we're going to be reading Chapter 7 of My Friend Flicka by Mary O'Hara. Before he even opened his eyes the next morning, Ken knew that something was wrong. He pushed away the moment of complete awakening. He lay, facing the window, and saw the pines on the hill quiet. No wind today. Then he remembered. He had stampeded the mayors. He had a feeling that it was late. For some time, he had been half hearing all the early morning noises. Gus opening the kitchen door. The only reason his steps across the kitchen floor and the shaking down of the ashes and the making of the fire didn't wake everyone was because they were so used to it. There had been steps going down, too, and his mother's voice saying, Time to get up, boys. He slipped out of bed and went to the window, hitching up his pajamas. Howard was on the terrace right underneath, and Ken could see the top of his head, black and smooth, with a part exactly in the center. He had on blue jeans and a clean chambray shirt and a red bandana. Howard looked up. Hi. Ken stared at him without answering. Howard's black eyebrows and his thin mouth were straight lines across his face. He was smiling a little, but his eyes were watching craftily. Mad at me, aren't you? Tattletale. I didn't tell on you. You're a liar. All I did was ask if Cigarette tossed you, and if you found the blanket. You started it. You knew I'd get it in the neck. That's not lying. You're always getting me in trouble. You want to say, let's make up, Ken. We could go down to the swimming pool. It's going to be hot. Ken glowered. We could start on the colts. What colts? Our summer colts. Dad left four of them in the calf pasture yesterday. We got a halter break them, like we did last year. I get first choice, he said. Do you choose one and then I choose one? And then you choose, and then I? Or do you choose both of yours first? Well, he said I could choose both first. I bet you're lying. I'll tell you what, Ken. If you'll make up, I'll choose just one and let you choose next. Their father's voice came loudly. Didn't I tell you to watch that sprinkler, Howard? Howard hastily changed the sprinkler. McLaughlin was coming from the tool house. He had let out the dogs, and they were jumping around him, frantic with joy, as if they were afraid every night there would never be another letting out or another morning. McLaughlin had a shovel in his hand, and went about the green, cleaning it of the manure of the horses that had been left, and shouting to Howard about taking an interest in the grass that had been so hard to start and was still hard to keep green. The red Rhode Island hen that had stolen the nest followed him, clucking and picking up, picking at the manure spots. And the hatch of cheeping yellow chicks swarmed around her, tiny feet twinkling at her call, and the wing fluffs beating the air. Ken faded back into the room and hastily began to dress. The smell of coffee filled the house. Howard watched his sprinkler, moving it little by little down the terrace, and planned his day. Ken would be all right now, he thought. He was never hard to manage. They might have fun at the swimming pool or go shooting. Breakfast, sang out Nell's voice. She ran out onto the terrace. She had on a green dress with a zipper all the way down front and a sash across the back. She clapped her hands and yelled for them to come. And Rob dropped the shovel and ran at her. And Ken stopped trying to, uh, his necktie to watch. His mouth was open and there was a little smile on his face because it was always fun when his mother and father started playing. She dodged and ran around the fountain, and her husband chased her, and reached out a hand and caught her sash and undid it. She screamed and ran for the steps, and both dogs ran in between them, barking and almost tripped him up. They'd gone in. Ken hurried to finish, but he hated to go down. He felt so out of things. On the way downstairs, he stopped before the picture of the duck, it was a big black duck with white breast and legs and white bars on the wings. He was fierce 
and handsome, standing on his rock, just about to launch himself into the waves of the gray, choppy lake. There is such a reaching in his eager beak and one lifted foot, and the forward tilt of his body. Ken felt as if it dragged him in, too. In another second, he would feel the icy sting and shock of the water, the bitter cold, sharp, up-pricked waves, and the grayness of the misty air hanging over it, full of fear and loneliness. His skin went goose flesh. At the breakfast table, his father was waiting to hear Ken clatter the rest of the way down the stairs. I bet he's looking at the duck, said Howard. What duck? On the landing. He looks at it for an hour sometimes. Howard, reproved now, he never looks at it for an hour. Well, a long time. Seems like an hour. In God's name, McLaughlin's voice was ringing. What duck on the landing? My Audubon print, explained Nell quickly. The one that hangs under the clock. Ken likes to look at it. Ken, roared his father and hastily Ken's sturdy shoes clattered the rest of the way down the stairs, and he came into the kitchen, his hair meticulously parted and slicked down, his face sullen. What did you stop on the landing for? Ken opened his napkin and looked down, embarrassed. I was looking at the duck. The duck? Out the window? The duck in the picture there. There was a little amused glint in Nell's eyes as she helped Ken to oatmeal. Didn't you know we were at breakfast? I, I didn't think, finished his father for him. Ken didn't look up or make any reply. He had known it would be like this. He poured cream on his oatmeal and reached for the brown sugar. Ken, said his father, I'm going to take back an order I gave you yesterday. I'm going to remit your hour of study. Ken looked at his father in astonishment. His mouth opened in relief and pleasure. I've got other plans for you this summer, McLaughlin continued pompously, and Nell tucked her face down to hide her smile. How often had she heard Rob order a bulky horse to woe or seen him spur and lash a runaway? And, continued Rob blandly, I'm going to give you a colt. Ken shot out of his chair. Spoon and dishes went clattering. A, a spring colt, Dad, or a yearling? McLaughlin was taken aback, but Nell dropped her eyes again. If Ken got a yearling colt, he'd even up with Howard. A yearling colt, your father means, Kenny, she said smoothly. Sit down and eat your pet breakfast. Look what you've done to your porridge. Ken gathered up the china and silver he had scattered, replaced them, and sat down again. Color had rushed to his face. I'll give it to you a week from today, said his father. Between now and then, you can look them over and make your choice. I can have any yearling colt on the ranch I want? asked Ken. His father nodded calmly, pushed his chair back, and took out his pipe. Speechless, Ken turned to look at Howard, and the two boys eyed each other. Even up at last. Does it have to be a yearling colt, Dad? asked Howard. Could it be a spring colt, if he'd rather have a spring colt? It could be anything foaled on the ranch since a year ago, said McLaughlin. There are 18 yearlings. So far, 13 or 14 new colts. A few to come yet. Will you take a yearling or a spring colt, Ken? asked Howard. In answer, Ken turned upon Howard in an exaggerated, pitying sneer, copied from the movies, and mastered only after much practice. But his father asked the same thing. Yearling or spring colt, Ken? Ken answered. A yearling. Horse or filly? This stopped him. His eyes lost focus as mental images crowded. Rocket was a mare, but there was Banner and the albino Mustang hero. There emerged from the confusion a definite sense of the superiority of the male. I'll take a horse colt. His voice was final and authoritative. An imperceptible glance passed between Nell and her husband. McLaughlin said, That narrows it down. Let's see, how many horse colts were foaled last year? Ten fillies and eight horse colts, said Howard. You've got eight horse colts to choose from, Ken. Things were moving very fast for Ken. Horses crowded him. Which were they, said Nell. I've got them all down in the stud book. 
I left it up at the stables the other day, in the tack room. Ken, run up and get it, and we'll look over the list. I'll go too, said Howard, sliding out of his chair, and both boys rushed out the door. Ken tore ahead. A colt, a colt, his own! His mind was full of images. A little foal just born, almost knocked down by its mother's tongue licking it. Banner rearing, his great forefeet beating the air, his big, light belly, his fierce face and arching back, a little yearling running, a black, a chestnut. His colt was all of them. He dropped his head back and yelled. He pranced and galloped. Howard caught up with him and said, You crazy! My colt, my colt, sang Ken. He ran in a circle, pacing, racking. He stuck his elbows out and said, Whoa there, hi! He tossed his head and shook his mane. You goofy, exclaimed Howard, watching him. Ken rushed up to him with his fists up. Howard fell into position and they sparred. Ken didn't care what happened to him. His arms went like flails. Howard blocked his blows easily. Ken broke out of it and went flying up to the stable. He had a sharp consciousness of change and new importance. Things had begun at last. Things could be real now. They found the stud book and ran back with it. As Nell read out the list of yearlings and the names of their dams, Ken began to feel queer. These were definite flesh and blood animals. Named, described, tagged, in a book. Not the colts that had kicked up their heels and played and tossed their manes in his dreams. He felt the sense of loss which every dreamer feels when the dream moves up, comes close, and at last is concrete. I haven't named them all, Nell was saying. There were some I never saw. They had run off somewhere when I went up to the 20 to look them over and put them in the book. The Bronk Bunch, grunted McLaughlin, referring to the progeny of the albino. They're always missing when wanted. Ken and I trained four of those yearlings ourselves, said Howard. Every summer, the two boys had a job of handling and a halter breaking four of the spring colts. The colts the boys trained last summer were Doughboy and College Boy and Lassie and Firefly, said Nell, studying the book. Two horse colts and two fillies. Say, Ken, said Howard eagerly, why don't you take Doughboy? He was one of yours, and when he grows up, he'll sort of be twins with mine, in his name anyway. Doughboy, High Boy, see? But Ken looked scornful. Doughboy would never have half High Boy's speed. Last summer, McLaughlin, looking over the colts, had said, He's a chunk. We'll name him Doughboy. He might turn out to be a heavy hunter. Look at the big legs on him. Lassie, then, suggested Howard again. If you like speed, she's fast as anything, and she's black as ink, like High Boy. I said I was going to take a horse, said Ken. Besides, Dad and it said Lassie'll never go over fifteen hands. Remember one thing, Ken said McLaughlin. You can't tell much about a colt when it's newborn, and not always much more when it's a yearling. Blood's the thing, the prepotency of blood. They had heard this term often, for whenever McLaughlin got talking about horses, he used it. That's the trouble with this stuff that I've got from the albino. He has prepotency, that devil passed on in his traits. They don't wear out. Must have some magnificent bloodstream somewhere in his ancestry. Arab, probably. Put enough Arab blood into a line and it gives it prepotency to the traits you don't want as well as those you do. Lots of Arab blood in these western mustangs. Comes from the Arab and barb horses the Spaniards brought over. McLaughlin got up, went to the shelf beside the spice closet, and took down one of his favorite books on the genealogy of the American horse. He turned the pages, looking for a passage. Howard suddenly jerked his head back, listening. Car coming! They all became motionless and heard the car rattle over the cattle guard at the home pasture fence, come up the low hill behind the house in second gear, then whiz past. The boys darted to the window at the back of the house and saw the rear of the car as it vanished over the crest of the hill on its way back to the stables. A dusty black car! announced Howard, returning. McLaughlin closed his book. Might be Doc, he said. 
To get the two-year-olds? asked Nell. Yeah. Howard, run up to the stables and see if it was Dr. Hicks. As Howard left the room, Ken asked, Can I watch, Dad? Nell caught her husband's eye, and he did not answer. Run up to my room and get at me a handkerchief, will you, Ken? She said, right-hand corner, top bureau drawer. When Ken had gone, she said, Rob, don't let them see the gelding. They might as well, said Rob. They'll have to, sooner or later. They know already, but so far they've never actually seen it. You've always done it before they've gotten home from school. Won't hurt him. Ken returned and handed his mother the handkerchief. Howard arrived almost at the same moment at the back door. It's Doc Hicks, Dad, and his assistant. I thought so. Run and tell Gus to light the fire up there and get some water boiling. He's already up there. He's got the fire lit. He was about to dash away, but Nell called him back. Sit down and finish your breakfast, she said. You too, Ken. You've hardly eaten a thing. The boys finished hastily. Gus appeared at the door. If we could have an old sheep and clean rags, missus. Nell brought an old sheep, clean and folded, from the linen closet. Ken finished eating, wiped his mouth, and said, Excuse me, please, and darted after Gus as he left the room. Dad's given me a colt, Gus. Any colt on the ranch up to a year old. Howard finished and ran after them. Nell sighed as she rose to clear the table. A bloody day. I hope they get through it all right. Rob did not answer. He wasn't looking at her. Suddenly he laughed. I'll take a horse, Colt. Did you hear the voice on him? When he said that, he's never talked or looked like that in his life before. He pushed his chair back and got up. Now, if he just picks a good one. He went out the door and hurried out. We'll read another chapter tomorrow. Good night.